Hello, I'm Otis Corbett, and today I want to share a word about our greatest resource as I comment on scriptures from Exodus chapter 3 and Exodus chapter 4 from a sermon I preached at Lockhart Baptist Church on August 14th, 2022. This morning, as we look at God's Word, I'd like us to turn to Exodus chapter 4, and we'll be looking at a scripture or two from chapter 3 as well. So we're looking at Exodus chapter 4 this morning, and uh, we're going to talk about resourceful people, or maybe even better, where our resources are come from? Where do resourceful people get their resources? I had a conversation once with a uh, church treasurer. He told me, he said, it's easy to be a church treasurer when you've got money in the bank. I mean, he said it was very easy. The the bills come in, you write the check, you put the check in the bank, uh, in the uh, envelope, you mail it off, and you don't worry about it anymore. Because you've got money in the bank. There are resources there to take care of your needs. He said the hard part comes when money is scarce. When money is scarce and you're a church treasurer, you've got to sometimes figure, what bill do I pay this week? Because you see the resources aren't there. Now, it's not just, of course, money that is the resource that sometimes is scarce because, frankly, resources are always limited because even when you have money in the bank, you don't have unlimited money in the bank. There are a lot of young people that used to start out when they got their first checkbook in their first checking account was as long as they had checks left in their checkbook, they assumed they had money left in the bank. Now, few people really write checks anymore, so maybe that's not a problem as it used to be. Uh, But when you have need and the resources are limited, that's when the problems start. See, when you have extra Sunday school teachers, the nominating committee has no problem at the end of the church year, do they? getting ready for the next church year, and you got extra people who can teach the Bible, it's, it's the, the problem you have is, is deciding who to disappoint as opposed to who to try to Shanghai into teaching a class. Uh, when you've got space in your church building to grow people, to bring new people into your community or into your church, that's not an issue. It's a, it's a great resource. If you've got land that you can build more buildings or more parking lots, then that's not a problem, is it? But when you don't have that land, or if you don't have those seats in the pews, that can be a problem. When you have people in your church that have energy and like to do things, or if you have people in your church that like to be with one another, and they like to fellowship with one another, then you don't have a problem. But when you have people in the church that are tired and worn out, or they think they are, and you have people in the church that are cross rise with one another, that's the kind of resource you don't need. Isn't that true? And the same thing happens in our home life. When you've got enough running cars so that everybody can get to work, then you're okay. I was at a... uh, I was at an event yesterday in Montgomery. I was actually uh, doing uh, some uh, first aid training. It's a long story why I needed to do that, but I had a need to go and take a Red Cross first aid training. And when we got there that morning, yesterday morning, the, the poor lady that was teaching the class had been locked out of the building. She couldn't get to the key. Now, a key to a locked building is an important resource. And then when she got all that sorted out, um, uh, she asked us, does anybody here have jumper cables? Because <laughs> her battery had died on her car as soon as she got to the location that morning. 
So it's not just in churches where you have resource issues. It's in many other parts of our life as well. Not everybody lives next door to grandmama who can watch the kid whenever he gets up in the middle of the night or she gets up in the middle. When we were pastoring in Russell County, when I was pastor at Crawford Baptist Church in Russell County, my mom and dad lived six minutes away from our house, from the pastor. And when, uh, when my son sometimes had the colic when he was young and he would wake up at one o'clock in the morning and didn't go back to sleep, it was sure nice people call grandmama and granddaddy to come get him. And they did, and they spoiled us. But sometimes you don't live six minutes away from grandmama or granddaddy. So when we think we don't have resources or when we don't understand how to apply our resources, then we get into a problem. And we'll see that here in Exodus chapter 4, beginning in verse 1. <coughs> Excuse me. <clears throat> God had called Moses to go and to deliver the people of Israel, the children of Israel, out of slavery in Egypt. And then this is what Moses said back to God. Then Moses answered, But behold, they will not believe me or listen to my voice, for they will say, The Lord did not appear to you. And the Lord said to him, What is in your hand? And he said, A staff. And then he said, Throw it on the ground. And that's where we're going to stop for right now. Father, we thank you for your word and your encouragement to us. Because, Father, as we look around the world today, there is much trouble, there's much difficulty, there's much strife. But, Father, this is nothing new. This is no surprise to you. This is nothing you haven't seen before, and it's nothing we will not see again in the future. But as you never change, you are the same yesterday, today, and tomorrow. Help us to see today how you dealt with Moses and know that as you dealt with him, as you have helped him and provided him the resources he needed, so today you will also provide us the resources that we need. So bless us now as we look at your word in Jesus' name. Amen. So as we look at this passage of scripture and we see Moses and God talking about what Moses was about to do, there's some things we need to see. And the first thing we need to see is that God knows exactly where you are and he can use you where you are. God knows exactly where we are in this country, in this state. We, he knows, you know, there aren't that many people in the world that know where Covington County is, except when they're going to Florida. And, and there are probably fewer people that know where Lockhart is. Well, some people think y'all are part of Florida. Did you know that? Yeah. But you don't. But God knows where we are and God can use us. Where was Moses? Look back at Exodus chapter 3, beginning in verse 1. Now Moses was keeping the flock of his father-in-law Jethro, the priest of Midian, and he led his flock to the west side of the wilderness and came to Horeb, the mountain of God. So where was Moses? Well, Moses as I have said on other occasions, was on the back side of the desert. Moses was in a place that nobody went. Nobody knew where he was. Nobody knew where this place was. It was out in the middle of nowhere. When I was uh, working as a state missionary in the Alabama Baptist State Board of Missions, uh, I had thought I had been out to the middle of nowhere until I started to look for these rural churches in Alabama. And I have now discovered that I have actually been to the middle of nowhere on multiple occasions. And if, and if you think we have some rural places in Covenant County, well, you haven't seen West Alabama. I'm telling you, there are places that are like this mountain of Horeb that's out in the middle of nowhere. Now, the difference, though, is in Alabama, our lands are rich. You know, out in West Alabama, they call it the Black Belt. Why is it the Black Belt? Because the soil is black and rich and it's fertile. 
Well, where Moses was, was a desert. It was not good for very much. It was barely used for anything. It was barely used even for raising sheep. It was off the beaten path. My brother and sister, uh, my brother-in-law and my sister, my sister and my brother-in-law, when they moved back uh, to the place where they now live, which is my family land out in Lee County, they actually wanted to live on the back side of that piece of property. They had two pieces of property, uh, a piece of property on the road, and then a piece of property on the back side of that particular piece of of, um, of land where they had inherited from uh, my father and from actually bought some land from an uncle. And, and you know what? They couldn't get the house built back there because they couldn't get power lines run back there. And what they've discovered is, and what I've discovered too, is land that's way off the road is not really worth very much because you can't get to it. And you can't get resources to it. Oh, you can if you want to spend thousands and thousands of dollars. Moses was on the backside of the desert. Now, what, what was he doing up there? Well, he was chasing sheep. He was keeping sheep in line. He was fighting off wolves, but mostly what he was doing back there was he was hiding from Egyptians. You see, Moses had been a prince of Egypt. And Moses had everything at his beck and call. He was educated. He was wealthy. He was the uh, one who would inherit a large portion of the Pharaoh's wealth. And yet, in a fit of anger, in a fit of uh, uh, indiscretion, he threw it all away. He murdered someone. And so he had to run away. So mostly what he was doing on the backside of the desert was hiding from the Egyptians. Now notice, you can hide from Egyptians, but you can't hide from God. God knows where we are. He knows if we're in New York City, or in Chicago, or Montgomery, or Florala, or Lockhart. He knows where we are. And he knows the difference between Florala and Lockhart. Just like I know the difference between Rose Hill and Dozier. And I know the difference between Babby and Ah. God knows where we are. He knows what we're doing. Now, where are we though? Are we in a desert? Well, in a way, we're in sort of a desert in our lives today. We're in sort of a desert. Uh, we have come through a very great trial called COVID-19, and we are on the back side of COVID-19. At, at the beginning of COVID-19, everybody said, well, it's just the flu. Well, it wasn't the flu. It was different from the flu. It was more deadly than the flu we have now. But you know what? It really wasn't any more deadly than the 1918 flu. So in really ways, it was sort of like the flu. In 1918, we had the flu, and then over time, we got to live with the flu. And now we're getting to live with COVID-19. But it took a lot out of us. There are people who are no longer with us who were with us in 2018 and, and 2019. And there are people in our churches that are no longer diff with us before COVID-19. They've gone to other churches. That's the weird part about COVID. Not only have people passed away, but people have gone to other places and it doesn't make sense. But here's the truth. Wherever we are, God knows where we are. And whatever we're doing, God knows what we're doing. And God looks down and he says, I can use him for this purpose. I can use her for this purpose. I can use this church for this task. I can use this church for that task. God is not ignorant of our situation. God is not ignorant of what our resources are. God knew exactly where Moses was. He knew exactly what Moses was doing. He knew exactly what Moses had. God is not ignorant. He knows. And he also knows that he can use what he chooses to use. There's an old statement that God can strike a straight blow with a crooked stick. Well, let me tell you, God can strike a blow without a stick. And he's about to teach Moses that lesson. Let's look on. 
So we see where Moses was. And we see that God knew where he was. And we see that God could use him where he was. Then we also see that God can use us whatever we have. Look at what he says here. Verse 2 in chapter 4. And the Lord said to him, what is in your hand? And he said, a staff. Now, uh, Moses was a shepherd at this point. And what Moses had was a shepherd's staff. Now, uh, a lot of times you see that as a, uh, a, a, a tall stick with a hook at the top called a shepherd's crook. Truth be told, we don't know that Moses even had a shepherd's crook. It's very possible that all Moses had was a stick. But let's just say he had a shepherd's crook. You know, a shepherd's crook is very useful for guiding sheep and for protecting sheep. And when that sheep gets stuck in that ditch or whatever, you can pull it out with that hook. It's a very useful thing to have, but it's only really useful for a shepherd. I mean, what use do I have for a shepherd's crook? Well, it's a cane. Well, yeah, but it's an awful tall cane. I mean, I mean, I can't use that as a cane. What, what good does a shepherd's crook do for me? And what good does a shepherd's crook do when it comes to liberating a people from slavery? You may have heard the term bringing a knife to a gunfight. That is not a career-enhancing experience. Okay, that is not a life enhancing experience when you bring a knife to a gunfight. It just not it just doesn't work very well. And Moses was being asked to bring a stick to confront one of the basically the superpower of the known world at that time. And he was asking him to go back into the lion's mouth. He was asking him to go back to confront his uncle or whoever was the, the whatever relationship that was with the Pharaoh. I'm, we're not, I'm, I'm not really sure we know exactly what relationship Moses, but, but it was his uncle or, or his brother or, or somebody, but it was his adopted relative whom he had turned his back on and run away from. And he was asking him to go to a group of people whom he had never really been a part of and he'd been away from for 40 years. Now, in Alabama, we have this saying when we see somebody that uh, tries to get in the middle of our business, right? That saying is, you ain't from around here, are you? You, you ain't from around here. You don't know how we do it here in South Alabama. And really, we don't care how you did it back up wherever you're from. And Moses knew that was what was going to happen when he went out uh, back into the land of Egypt. And he was going to take them to a place that they had never seen before, And they weren't even sure that it even existed. And he was going to represent a God that maybe no one in Egypt ever really believed in anymore. And he was going to do it with a stick. Yeah, sure, right. Mm -hmm. Sure. Now, what do we have? If Moses had a stick, what do we have? Well, we have a lot more than that. We have beautiful church facilities. We have air conditioning. We have resources you won't believe. You know, I, I, I sometimes have a hard decision to make when I go to preach. What Bible am I going to take with me? Do I want to take this Bible? Or do I want to take this Bible? Or are these, are these is this a big enough print for me to see in this church? Or can I... Can I take this other Bible that I like? But the you go to we we in, in our association, you know, we have the Christian bookstore now, and, and Pat Kelly can help you order just about anything that you want in terms of Christian resources. We have technology, we have talent, we have ability, we have fellowship, we have the Holy Spirit in our lives in our churches. And so we have an awful lot more. 
than Moses did. But you know what? Moses even had more than he thought he had. Let's look on. So uh, the, the Lord said to him, what is in your hand? He said, a staff. And he said, throw it on the ground. And so when it, he threw it on the ground and it became a serpent. Well, right then, God has just lost me. Okay, There are only two kinds of snakes that I know about. The ones I don't see and dead ones. Okay. Now, I know that no, I know there are good snakes and king snakes. I got that, but not for me. There are two kinds of snakes in my life, dead ones and the ones I don't know are out there. OK, that's just me. Don't know about you, but just me. And Moses ran from it. That's a good, good, normal response. But then the Lord said to Moses, put out your hand and catch it by the tail. So he put out his hand and he caught it and it became a staff that they may believe in the Lord, the God of their fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob has appeared to you. And again, the Lord said to him, put your hand inside your cloak. And he put his hand inside his cloak. And when he took it out, behold, his hand was leprous like snow. And then the Lord said, put your hand back inside your cloak. So he put it back inside his cloak. When he took it out, behold, it was restored like the rest of his flesh. You know, there's something else that we have Something else that Moses has too. Moses had his faith. Moses had his faith. And, and he had enough faith that when that snake was wriggling on the ground, he reached out and grabbed it by the tail. Now, I, I, I know enough about snakes. No, you don't grab it by the tail. You grab it by the head. But he had his faith. And we have our faith. And unlike Moses, who was asked to go back into an, uh, the land of Egypt where he was a wanted criminal to uh, bring out his people to a place that he didn't know where it was and neither did they, what is God asking us to do? Well, he's asking us to preach the gospel. He's asking us to preach the gospel. Now, he said, you need to make disciples of all people. He says, love your neighbor as yourself. God, God wants us to give the very best thing that people could ever have. You see, he was asking Moses to go back and liberate the children of Israel from the slavery in Egypt. And God is asking us to go and preach the gospel and help people be delivered from the slavery of sin. He's asking us to teach the Bible and make disciples, people who grow and are able to overcome trouble in their lives. He, he's asking us to go and minister to people's needs. We, we've been talking this morning about the, the food uh, donation for the Christian service centers and how you can be a part of that ministry, helping people. Most of the people that we help are what we call the working poor, people who have jobs but they can't make ends meet on what they're making. We have a lot of those folks that we help, and you can help those folks. He said, you need to do all this, according to Paul, decently and in order. And frankly, our task is an awful lot easier than the task Moses was given. I mean, it's awful. I mean God, God hadn't asked us to go and reach out and grab a snake by the tail. He hasn't asked us to, to go and to confront Pharaoh what he's asking us to do basically is a definition of evangelism is one poor beggar telling another poor beggar where to find bread, which is the living bread, the living water. So as we think about resources being limited, as we think about the struggles we have to, to make ends meet, both at home and at church, we, we need to remember that God knows where we are. And God knows what we have. And God will make the best of those things. He will make the best of that situation. Think about the leaders in the Bible and the people in the Bible that God used. Think about people. Now we see Moses here. Moses liberated his people and he did a wonderful job. He did a wonderful work and God worked through him. But we also see Joshua. We see Joshua who led the children of Israel 
into the land of Canaan, the promised land, the land that was flowing with milk and honey, but it was a land also inhabited according to the spies by people who made them look like grasshoppers. And the night before the children of Israel went into the promised land, you know what Joshua did? He walked through the camp and said, be bold and be strong because the Lord, your God, is with you. We see Caleb. We see Caleb who was 80 years old and he came up to Joshua and said, give me the hard place. Give me the hill people, the tough, those tough hill people. I'm as good a man today as I was when I was 40 and I want the tough place to be able to show my faith to God and to give God the glory. Give me the tough problem. And he did. And he overcame. And we see David who saved God's people from the Philistines. We see uh, later on, many, many years later, we see Nehemiah rebuilding the walls of Jerusalem and Ezra rebuilding the temple and more importantly, rebuilding the worship in Israel. We see, of course, Jesus establishing the church. We see Paul and Silas evangelizing the known world. Now, think of every one of these people's situation. Humanly, those situations were not very promising. But God triumphed anyway, and he used those people to do that. And why did those things happen? They happened because of God. Listen, God is going to ask us to do some things you don't expect. David, the little shepherd boy. Who who was David? David was a little shepherd boy who had a pretty face and could play the harp. That's who David was. Now, that's not a lot of skill to become a king in in Israel. But God chose him for that purpose. Think about that. Think about Peter. Peter, who was a fisherman. That's all he wanted. Think about Peter. He was a fisherman. That's all he could do. That's what he knew. And in fact, after Jesus was... uh, crucified. And after he rose again, Peter was so confused. You know what he did? He said, I don't know what's going on, but I do know one thing. I know how to fish. I'm going back. I'm going to go fishing. That's who Peter was. He's going to ask you to do things you don't expect. And he's going to ask you to uh, use things that you don't expect to use. Like throwing down a shaft, um, a rod and picking up a snake. He's going to bring you people you don't expect. And he's going to encourage you in ways that you don't expect. Let me ask you, do you think Moses, when God said to him, you're going back to Egypt, and God, and he turned to God and said, well, I, what? What do you want me to do? Do you think the most encouraging thing that Moses could have had experienced at that point was for uh, him to be asked to pick up a snake? Do Do you think the most encouraging thing to Moses at that point would be to pull out a leper's hand from his cloak? No. <coughs> so what should we do? Well, we should do exactly like all of these people that I talked about. Not just Moses, but Peter and, and, and Ruth and, and David and Ezra and Nehemiah. We should trust God's judgment and his will. God really does know better than we do. Just ask Abraham. Abraham was told, I'm going uh, uh, to make you a great nation, but he didn't have a son. So what did he do? He and Sarah uh, conspired together and said, well, you just go and have a baby with Hagar. That'll count. No, that wasn't what God had in mind. We need to do it God's way and trust God. Allow him to use whatever we have. 
David had a harp and he was a shepherd and God knew how to use those things. He had a, 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 a sling, which is really just a piece of leather and five smooth stones. But God could use that. And then we need to enjoy what God does with us. We need to just look back and step back and say, you go, God. You go. Look at you go. Look at what you're doing. And just be amazed at what God has done. So when we look around and we say, we don't have a lot of resources right now. We don't have a pastor. We don't have a parking lot. I'm not trying to be, you know, you, there's a, parking lots are very useful in the 21st century for cars. I mean, they're just very useful. There's a lot of things we may not have. But if we put what we have at the disposal of God, I'll guarantee you he'll use it. I'm going to close by telling you a story of a fellow that I met when I was pastoring in Russell County. This fellow's name was Jack Kinley. Now, Jack, to me, is one of the heroes of my, of my past experience when I was serving, uh, when I've been serving uh, in the ministry. Jack Kinley was in World War II a tank commander in Europe. He was commanding a tank. His tank was hit by a German round, and he was blown out of the top of the tank. He was standing in the hatch of his tank and it got hit by that German round and it popped him out like you would pop out a cork and just poop, popped him out and he landed on the ground. And it blinded him. It shocked his nerves in his head. He had some sort of a trauma from that experience and it blinded him. And for two days, he couldn't see a thing. And then his sight came back. And over time, over the years, God used him in a number of different ways. He uh, became a police officer in a local police uh, department. He was a police officer in Columbus, Georgia. He was a motorcycle policeman. And then one day he noticed one of his eyes started to get dim. And then he lost sight in one of his eyes while he was still a motorcycle policeman. Didn't tell anybody. Now, that's a scary thought, isn't it, to be riding a motorcycle with just one eye. And then guess what? He lost the sight in his other eye. But during that time, God called him into ministry. And as a blind man, he was pastor of a church that had a school. And he was headmaster of a school when he couldn't see. And then as he continued on and, and got older and he was at the point of retirement, he, Jack retired. And when Jack retired, he said, I, I've got to do something. And he got involved with a service where he would take the Alabama Baptist newspaper and he would read it onto a cassette and record it and then he would send it off to the State Board of Missions and they would mail it to hundreds of people all over Alabama who could not see, but they could read the Alabama Baptist by listening to that tape. And he did that for years and years and years and serving God faithfully all that time. And then guess what happened? One day his eyes started to get better. He started to see more light. And then he started to see people. And then you know what? God called him to be a pastor of a, of a small church. And the last I heard from Jack Kinley, he was pastoring that church. Now, if Jack, who had lost his eyesight, could continue to serve God, what can we do with what God has given us? Now, that's the challenge for this morning. Resources are always limited. But you know what our number one resource always is? It's God. Because God is not limited. God is unlimited. God is the creator and sustainer of this world. God owns the cattle on a thousand hills, but you know what? He owns the hills too. He owns the gold under the hills and down there below the gold, there's some oil. <laughs> and you know what? He owns that too. He knows what we have. He knows where we are. 
He knows what He wants to do with us. And He's just waiting for us to be laborers together with Him. Father, we thank You for Your Word today. We thank You for uh, not only Your Word, Father, but also the fact that Your Word illuminates how we can overcome the difficulties in our life. And Father, the key to that is simply trusting You. You will put us in the right place to do the right thing at the right time with the right things if we only trust you and let you have your way in our lives. Father, Moses had many excuses, but none of those excuses had any weight with you at all. And the same is true for us today. So, Father, as we come to a time of invitation, let us decide to trust in you and allow you to use what you've given us in the way you've called us to use it for your glory and honor. And, Father, in the end, we too will be blessed. Thank you for your love now. Bless us as we make our decisions today. In Jesus' name, amen. Before I go, let me share my new book with you. Seminary taught me to be a pastor, but the Army taught me to be a leader. I would like to share how God melded those two skill sets in my new book, Decently and in Order. It's available now on Amazon in paperback and on Kindle. If you want to know more about effectively leading teams and events, check out Decently and in Order on Amazon.com. I believe you will find it eye-opening and helpful. That's Decently and in Order by Otis Corbett. Thanks for taking a look.